I'm not Chris, I'm Aaron. Uh, I do exist. Um, I just don't like being in front of camera. So hello. Uh, it's good to be with you this morning. Uh, I hope you had a great Thanksgiving, whatever that looked like uh, for you and your family. And um, I hope you did spend some time um, finding those things which uh, you've been blessed with, uh, those things which you uh, can receive with gratitude. Uh, I wanted to give a couple of announcements, and then we'll talk about the uh, candle in the room. So uh, first of all, um, this Christmas we are supporting the Starfish, Starfish Project. And so the Starfish Project works to help those with mental health and uh, addiction recovery um, needs. And they partner with those people to get them on the right path, to get them where they need to be, the resources they need to uh, make forward steps in life. And so we're partnering with them this year in two ways. One, uh, you can support them by uh, just giving directly to uh, their organization. Uh, and, and then two is we're also partnering with them to find some families to um, partner with uh, and encourage this uh, Christmas season and to be able to support them in, um, in those tangible ways as well. And then the other thing I wanted to talk about was the Christmas Eve service that uh, is planned to be happening at 7 p.m. at the gazebo uh, right here in downtown Mansfield. And that's at 7 p.m. 
uh, this is a really cool opportunity. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm personally pretty excited about it. Um, but you can find out more information about these things on the website, which is mosaicmansfield.com. And then you go over to the What's Happening section of the website, and there's more information there. So go check that out. So now, talking about this, this candle. So today, November 29th, is the first Sunday of Advent. Uh, and Advent is a season in which we seek to quiet ourselves in order to reflect on the arrival of Jesus. He's the Son of God who in the flesh, because of the love of God, comes to take away the sins of the world, both yours and mine, as he demonstrates the nature and the character of our God, as he himself is God. This season encourages us to do some self-examination as we ponder the coming of God in Christ in the flesh, born in Bethlehem. We were created to live with God, towards God, and for God, and our hearts will continue to remain restless and in turmoil, as Augustine says, until we find our rest in him. So our desire this season is to work together to quiet our hearts, to let the Spirit of God convict us and call us toward Christ, and through that to find lasting hope, joy, and life. So as a, a tangible means of doing that, we're going to be reading some scripture and lighting a candle each Sunday um, for the next four weeks. This week, we are reflecting on the hope of God, and the burning candle in front of me represents that hope. This hope of God is the hope that God had promised from the very beginning to redeem and rescue us from the earliest stages of sin in Genesis 3, 16. Uh, he's been faithful to that promise. This candle, as it burns, reminds us of the confidence and the hope that we should have in this and every season as we look back on the fulfillment of God's promises in the coming of Christ and then look forward to the return of Christ prophesied in the New Testament. God is true to his word, and therefore we can have hope. So in addition to lighting a candle, we'll be reading a section of scripture. And so I'll be reading from Isaiah 9, verse 2, and then verses 6 and 7. These are familiar Christmas passages, so I would encourage you to take a second and to quiet your heart before God and to just listen to these, asking the Spirit to move and lead and highlight and guide. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Almighty Lord will accomplish this. Father, many years it's easy to hear these verses, to think of Charlie Brown and um, to have warm feelings. But this year, in a year where we're wrestling with government and justice and hope and enduring peace and righteousness and all of those things, we need that. We resonate with that. Lord, you have come in Christ and you will come again. And we look forward to that. We long for that. We long for a hope and a peace and a kingdom of righteousness and healing and fulfillment all the days of every life forever. And so this season, as we look back and see the character of God, to see your character, God, may we be filled with hope, a hope that will not disappoint, a hope that will not fail because you will not fail. You will accomplish this because of your zeal, your love for us. We thank you to be the recipients of your love undeservedly. We thank you that you continue to work on our behalf in a million different ways, working out good because it brings you joy and glory. 
And we thank you that because you are so committed to those things, we can have hope that even in the midst of every argument and every discussion and every worry and every injustice, you are at work and you will see things through. You came and you will come. Give us hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where streams of abundance flows. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, or I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name.
Father, we just, um, we trust in your unfailing love and the love you demonstrated in the person of Jesus. And it's not merely that the Bible tells us so, Lord God, but as we have, as we receive that love that Jesus offers, as we receive the grace by which you offer it, it sits well with our spirit, your spirit of love speaks to our heart. It says in Romans that you pour, your, you pour your love, that divine love you poured into our hearts by your spirit. So Father, as we look at the truth of who you are and we see in the scriptures who Jesus is and what he has done, Father, may it not just be something we know, but it's something we know deep down in our heart because it agrees with the spirit that you have placed there in our spirit. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. All right, I want to take a minute. Um, first of all, I miss everybody again. Um, I'm going to try to be pretty systematic this morning. Uh, if you can get a hold of the notes, get there. Um, I just feel like I, I, there are some things I really want to work through this morning. Uh, miss seeing faces. Um, but, but with that, I think we need to spend a moment in prayer for our community and, and um, this, you know, just uh, the surrounding area. You know, I... I there isn't a day that goes by that I don't receive a phone call or a message from somebody whose health is suffering or ha they have suffering in their family. There are some, as we know, that the suffering is just the knowledge that they are infected. Um, 
for some, it's been very serious and very acute. And it, that there's a wide range of folks that I hear from daily. So if you would join me in prayer, um, I'd appreciate it. Father, we come before you and thank you for the bodies you have given us and how your spirit courses through it, Lord Jesus. There's nothing that happens in us that you're not fully aware of and that you don't want to work for the good of those who love you and have been called according to your purposes. And that is, Father, that we would lean into you, that we would trust you, that we would look to you. As the psalmist says, that we would just even get a glimpse for a moment the number of our days and in so begin to live with wisdom and the recognition and the appreciation and the gratitude for the incredible graces that you bestow upon us. Father, we pray for each individual who's ailing, Lord God, and pray that your healing hand would be on them. Father, um, we would pray that you would miraculously heal them. But we also know, Lord God, that you work through these things. And so, Father, we would pray according to your will and what that healing would look like. It's not up to us. But what we can pray with, with the utmost confidence is that you would use these things to your glory, that these people would be an expression of your grace and a joy that, um, and a peace that transcends the moment. So, Father, be with them. Comfort them. Families of those who are ill, Lord, we pray their protection. We pray, uh, again, peace for them. We pray for those households that you would knit them together. And Lord, we pray that you would be ever present. We pray for those who are in the medical field, Lord, and put in the, to, you know, to some degree put, putting their life on the line. And I pray that you would protect them and grant them strength and stamina. Uh, grant them hope. If they know you, Lord God, may be, they be absolutely messengers of your grace. If they don't know you, Lord, may you use even this to draw them to yourself. But we pray that you would grant them health and strength, protect their families, Lord God, give them peace. And I pray, Lord, you would just bring the right people at the right time to do the right thing in the right way into each one of their lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So what we're doing is we've been talking about, for the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about loving and then loving as we have been loved. And that word as has been a really big part of what we're doing. And we're, we're going to extend that a little bit further as we go uh, in, into the season that Aaron spoke of before. You know, God so loved the world, right, that he gave his one and only son. And the coming of his son was the expression of his love as he loves and how we're to love one another as he's loved us. And Jesus, you know, Jesus' sacrifice began way before the cross. It began when we, even we see in Philippians 2, it, be, it began when he laid down his glory and chose to come. But it, in Ephesians, it says that it began before that, that before the creation of the world, God had laid this thing out. I've had conversations with folks It's like, well, couldn't God have made another way? Well, yeah, he could have made another way. Absolutely. And yet could not. Because God knows every way it could have happened, but he also knows the best way and the most effective way and the most profound way in which to do it. And he chooses the best way according to his wisdom that would express his love most profoundly and his mercy and grace most completely. And this is the way he's chosen. This is when we have to trust God and his character and his goodness and his glory, his wisdom and his grace. So that's kind of where we are. And so, we, and, and so he, as profoundly as he's loving us, that he has chosen this most wise and most effective way to love, he now says, now I want you to love others in the same way. So let's uh, go to the notes. If you have them, great. You're going to need your Bible. We're going to do a lot of scooting around today. But if you follow the notes, I, I, I think... Uh, Hopefully, like I said, I'm going to try to remain pretty systematic today. So we're calling to love as Jesus loves, the truth of our ability to love others or each other as Jesus loves us. So it's right at, the, right at the root of God's love for us, his heart's divine nature that expresses this divine love. So in his divineness, he loves us, and this love is divine. It is a God love. Now, the, the, the encouragement we have and the strengthening we have is this. He has placed his divine love in our hearts by his spirit. But not just so we can ourselves experience it. Although we can experience it, we do experience it, we can be grateful for the experience. That's not the only purpose of that love being planted in us. But it's now that we, now that we have experienced it, we can now express it too. We have the privilege of joining God in his loving. As we have been loved, we get to love. And he delights in his love. He delighted in loving us. He delighted us and delights in loving us the way he does. And we will find delight in doing the same. And now we're empowered to do that. So we have, you know, so it's not just so we can experience this thing now. It's so we can express it. It is this type of love 
that God, um, then God can rightly and justly command us to demonstrate, to express to others. Why can he command it justly? Because we've, he's, he's poured it into us. It's poured it onto us. We've experienced it. And now he's empowered us to do it. We have the privilege of participating in God's divine nature this way. Think about that for a minute. We get to participate in God's divine nature by the spirit he's placed in us. Now, what I want to do is I want to describe what this love looks like, and then we're going to take it apart and, and talk about how do we do this? How do we engage with God in this? So I'm going to return, ask you to turn to Romans 12, if you would. We're going to look at verses 9 through 12. So I'm going to give you a second to get there. Romans 12, or 9, uh, 12, 9 to 21. I guess it's going to be on the screen, too. I didn't even think about that. So here we go. This is So Father, bless this word to our heart. May we just be enlightened by the truth of who you are and what you've done and what is inside of us and then what we can do in you. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. So it says this, it says, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Now, here's the danger. This is an incredibly, if you've gone to Mosaic for any length of time, this is an incredibly familiar text. So it it could easily go, oh, I've read this before. I've seen this before. Tony talks about this. Yes, I talk about it all the time. Why is that? Because he's describing and defining love for us, and he's teaching us how to do it, and with whom? And there isn't a day that goes by that I don't have a new encounter in which I have to apply this. A new, a, new, a new circumstance. So he says, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. That has to be a constant reminder for my flesh. I am constantly drawn, my flesh is constantly drawn, my eyes are, eyes are constantly drawn to the affection of this world, the des- my desires for this world. I have to be continually brought back. So I'm, I, I, I have to remind myself that evil is something that separates. Evil is something that puts people in peril. Evil is something that is contrary to God. I need to hate that which is evil, that which brings harm, that which brings division, that which would divide somebody from God and one another. I am to hate that and hate the results of it. I have to be reminded of that truth. And then I'm called to cling to what is good, what ties us together, what is for somebody's welfare, what is for their ultimate good and well-being. So I'm to hate what is evil and every consequence of evil, and I'm to cling to what is good, hold on tight to it. And it's interesting to me that he says, hate what is evil. In other words, I am to commit myself to not having any affection for it or any allegiance with it. I'm to hate it. That's a really important moment. Then he says to cling to what is good. And why does he use the word cling here? We're to hold tight. It's an act of holding. Well, because that which I hate, you know, if we were to go back to Romans 7, it says, the thing I want to do is the thing I don't find myself doing. That is the good, right? But the very bad, the thing that I don't want to do, that's what I find myself doing. Well, why? Because my flesh is drawn there. My spirit calls me back. My, my flesh has a tendency to want what the world offers because it's titillating. It's, it's attractive to it. And so what I have to do is I have to actively see it for what it is and what it does, and in so foster, if I'm allowed to foster hate, it's for that which is evil, which is perilous, which is harmful. But then he says, now you have to actively cling to what is good, hold tight to what is good. Because first of all, you can't get rid of anything without replacing it with something else. We create a vacuum. And so when we remove that which is perilous, we remove, remove that which is, which, which is harmful, we, we, we detest it as to push it away. We are to cling to what is good, hold tight to it. Well, why is that? Because our flesh doesn't always want what's good. Because what's good here means that which is beautiful and, and pertaining to the spirit of God. That the Spirit of God is working in me to accomplish his bidding and to bear his fruit. My flesh doesn't want anything to do with that. And so there's this, this push-pull going on. And there's this active, active fostering of a despising of that which, which breaks. And then clinging on to that which builds. Now, what does that look like? Look at verse 10. We then are, be, we are to be devoted to one another in this sincere love. Honor one another above yourselves. Know that you're loved in such a way that without any diminishing of self in regard to self-deprecation, the hurting of self, right? With humility, honor one another as better than yourself. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction. Walk slowly, wait on God, work with God in that which afflicts you. Faithful in prayer, be consistent and faithful, unceasing in prayer. You know, this, this constant attitude of prayer, this attitude of coming before God. 
Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Be, be alert and aware of what's going on around you and the needs of those around you. And then practice hospitality. Invite them into your life. Bless those who persecute you. This is where it gets tough, right? This is a sincere love ex- and, and where to express it to one another or express it to others as God has expressed it to me. So it must be sincere. I'm to hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourself. That's what Jesus did. He made himself nothing, not only in the nature of a human being, but as a servant. He never lacked zeal. He served his father and, and, and continued to bubble up. His spiritual fervor bubbled up as he served. Joyful in hope, that which we are called to. Patient in affliction, that which we are currently in to which we see through to our hope, and faithful in prayer that we're continually communicating with God in that give and take with him, that, that, that exchange of wishes with God as we continue to present to him ourselves and our circumstances and those we love. In that, then, our eyes are open to be able to share with anyone who is in need, God's people in particular, and to practice hospitality, that you would be invited into my life. And then it gets, the, he tightens the screws a little bit. Verse 14 says, now bless those who persecute you. Bless those who come against you. Bless and do not curse. Why does he have to say this? Because my flesh's tendency is to want to strike back. The spirit in me says, no, no, bless them. Wish for their happiness. Wish for their good. Well, what is the ultimate happiness for anyone? Is that they would know God. That they would come to know God. That they would be redeemed right? So we want to bless those who persecute us and bless and not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people in low position. Remember your own poverty. Don't be conceited. Don't think of yourself more than you should or more highly than you should. Then he tightens it a little bit more in verse 17. He says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. But be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. This is a really important. Do not repay evil for evil, but be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Now, he called us to hate what is evil, right? And so evil will come against us. And what's going to be really important for us to to do is to not only hate the evil that comes against us, but hate the fact that we would want to to retaliate with evil or that we would retaliate with evil because that is not what is, that is not, that's not the righteous response. So he says, do not repay evil for evil, but be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. Let him vindicate. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, this is what we're called to do, because this is what Jesus did. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. You will bring down a conviction from God at, that, that, that what you have offered them is in utter opposition to what they have given you. In doing so, we, we, our prayer should be their blessing, their happiness, their, what is good for them. And what would that be? That this conviction, this conviction, this burning coals on the head would cause them to turn to God and receive him. That should always be our motive. Do not be overcome by evil. Don't allow evil to overcome you in such a way as to push you toward evil, to cause you to to do evil. Now remember, somebody doing evil to me, which causes me to do evil back, doesn't mean the evil that I do back is the responsibility of the one who gave me evil. No, it means what I've allowed to happen is that evil to overcome me in such a way as to cause me to respond in kind. That, no, the scripture says otherwise. Look what it says, go back to verse 17 again. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, he says, but be careful to do what is right in the eye of everybody, whoever sees, whoever hears, whoever the story is repeated to, are you doing right? What is, what is it to do right? To feed my enemy, to give them something to drink, and, and doing so to pray that these, that, that, that these actions would be an expression of God in such a way as to bring conviction on the soul and draw them to the Father. So don't be overcome by evil. Do not let evil overwhelm you. Don't let it distract you. Don't let it provoke you. 
Instead, overcome evil with good. In other words, when somebody comes at you with evil or you witness evil, so you bring the goodness of Christ into it. That's the call. That is what sincere love looks like. Now, what I want to do is define this a little more closely. And this is not in the note, so bear with me for a moment. This love that, that, Paul, that Paul is speaking of here, this agape, is an exercise of moral preference. Now, keep that in mind. Now, we, a few weeks ago, we talked about this a little bit, and I'm reiterating it because we've got to learn to apply it, right? So this love exercises a moral preference. It's a commitment to developing the desire to love someone where they are, as who they are and the condition we find them, as well as the circumstance that we're in that, that causes our lives to intersect. Now, I, I, wanna, I, I don't wanna go through that too fast. This love, it's, it's, it's a moral preference, which means we, having God's morals placed in us, his ethic placed in us, his character being born in us, we choose to love them the way God has loved me. And we just described that in Romans 12, right? So this is a moral preference, this is a decision I make based on the values that I possess that God has placed in me and I am cultivating with him. Remember, I have dominion over my life, which means I don't have to do everything God calls me to do to maintain my salvation. To not is to make me utterly ineffective in my ability to love or my testimony, right? But I don't have to. I have dominion. God's granted me dominion over this sphere. And so what he's saying is, listen, in the context of loving your enemy, I realize your flesh is screaming no. I realize the world is telling you, are you kidding me? We talked a couple weeks ago, maybe last week, about God's stupid love. Well, this is stupid love. This is a love that chooses to morally apply itself by the by the values that God's establishing in us and we are cultivating with him to want the welfare of our enemy. What is good for them? To bless them. This is crazy. Of course our flesh isn't gonna wanna do this. So we have to make a commitment to develop the desire to love. Because here's the thing, you know, when we think about sincere love, we go, well, I don't feel like loving them, so does that make it insincere? I don't feel anything for them. Or what I do feel for them is actually the opposite of love. Well, of course. That's the human way. That's the world's way. That's my flesh's way. So the moral preference means regardless of how I feel, regardless of the circumstance, regardless of who they are, where, they, where I find them, where, and listen, I'll go into this in a little more detail in a minute, but the fact of the matter is what are we called to do in this moment? We're called to recognize how God loves me. That was his moral preference. I was his enemy. I was opposed to him. I was steeped in sin, and yet he loved me anyway. His moral preference was for my well-being. And my blessing, that's ridiculous, right? So now he says, now you need to love as I've loved you. Now, that means it's got to be a moral preference. It's got to be a decision and dedication, a devotion and a commitment. And part of the commitment is learning, is developing the desire to love someone this way. That doesn't mean we're always going to feel the love, but what it is, is going to be, as we work with God on this, we will more and more naturally love this way. So it's a commitment to developing the desire to love someone, listen, who they are, where they are, here's what's next, the condition we find them in, and the, thir and the circumstance where we've been put together where our lives intersect. Which is, what, and it, which is what forces me to have to love. And so if, 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 if our lives never, never intersect, I don't know you, although I can certainly love in a general way, I don't know you enough to have to love you or to be called to love you or to committed to love you or to have to fight through everything you are to be able to love you. What does that mean? That means as soon as our lives intersect, I need to relate to Jesus and how I've been loved. I need to know who you are and see who you are and get to know who you are. I need to recognize where it is we have, you know, where it is you are as a person and what condition you're in. Well, what's the condition have to do with anything? Well, think about this for a minute. There are people whose hearts are in a condition of brokenness. Their hearts are in a condition of hatefulness. Their hearts are in a condition of despising or malice. Saved, unsaved. Children of God by Christ and those who are not. Filled with the Spirit, walking with the Spirit, have the Spirit, but not walking with the Spirit. Disobedient. I don't know. What my, you know. As my life intersects your life, my job is to go, how do I love you? 
Who are you? Where are you? What circumstance? What, what's the condition of your heart as I meet you? And what are the circumstances that have caused us to intersect? Sometimes those circumstances are fine and good. I rescue somebody on the side of the road. They rescue me. I meet them over a counter and I say hello and we, get, we engage one another. They hate me and they've gossiped about me and they've slandered me. How do I respond? They've stolen something from me. What do I do? Remember, the circumstances in which we find ourselves to a large degree colors how it is we see them. And we have to, we have to unfold that to see the condition of their heart. If they've stolen from me, it could be that they've just taken what they wanted and they just took it without asking or earning it. Or it could be that they have starving children at home. When I see the circumstance, I don't want to judge and love, quote unquote, according to the circumstance. I need to, un I need to unearth <clears throat> the heart and the condition of the heart beneath the circumstance. And as I begin to see the condition of the heart, I begin to hear whether they even know God. Or if they do, what's going on? And in so, I see where they are. Their season of life, their station of life. And through that, I learn who they are. And then love enters back in again. And all of a sudden, oh, oh, oh. And I get to decide to love them sincerely. I get to, and that sincerity is to recognize how I have been loved and, and being humbled by the fact that God would love me that way and the, who I was, where I was, the, the, the condition he found me in and the circumstances which our lives intersected, he loved me there. That's the as. So as I experience this intersection with someone in the context of a circumstance, my flesh is going to respond a certain way. It is up to me to stop and go, wait a minute, hold it, hold it. What's behind this? What's underneath this? What's inside of this? This is really important because this is how we develop sincere love. This is how we recognize God's sincere love for us and how we've experienced. This is how we recognize the sincere love that he's poured into our heart and then how to express it as it's been expressed to us. What's the ultimate goal? If they know Jesus, that they would be drawn back in as to walk with him rightly, to be taken care of and to know that the one another does take care of one another just as Jesus commanded if they don't know Jesus, might they come to know him? Would, we, would it be that we would be joyful for their salvation and their redemption and then their sanctification? They're becoming more like Christ for their good and God's glory. So I need to remind us, this is not how we feel about somebody. This can't be how we feel about somebody. Frankly, that's evil. Whether we derive pleasure from it and we love just for the sake of our own pleasure, there's a degree of evil in that. I'm not saying there isn't good in that or that when we love, we can't derive pleasure. That's not what I'm saying. But when that's the purpose of our loving, for us to derive pleasure or benefit without a lot of thought about what it does for the person in front of us, that is bordering on evil. Then, of course, evil is evil where you want, don't want anything for them because you feel about them a certain way. Sincere love, agape, the way Christ has loved me and calls me to now love as he loved means it has nothing to do with how I feel about this person. So we need to go back. Again, what circumstances am I in that where our lives intersected? What is the, am I willing to work through that to get to the condition of their heart? Once I realize the condition of their heart to the degree I'm able or the spirit allows me to see where have we, where are they? Whether that's with God, with me, or with others. And then who are they? Am I able to, willing to, committed to, dignifying their person, looking past their behavior? Because isn't that what Jesus did for me? He looked past my behavior. He didn't condone it. He didn't ignore it. But he looked past it and through it to me. And he called me. 
We're called to love the same way. So it's not how we feel about somebody. It's not how we feel about the circumstance. That would really rock our world, wouldn't it? It is not what we think or feel about their current condition. There are people we see what we perceive as their condition and we hate them for it. What they say, what they do, the attitude, the tone of voice. And we, we, we have ire for them. And, you know, we, mm, we got to mm, back up. This is about seeing into them. This is about seeing their person as God is, as he, un, as he kind of pulls back all the stuff, all the layers that get in front of us between us and another person. He, all those feelings, he kind of draws them back and says, let me, let me open your eyes. Let me show you. Let me show you them, each one. So it's about seeing them and then through all of the stuff to what God has for them. His plans and his purposes to make them prosper, as he said about his people in Jeremiah. This is the love Jesus loves me with. This is the love that he has poured into my heart by his spirit. This is the love he commands me to allow to be developed in my life. Do you hear the way I said that? that I would allow this to be developed in my life. This is what he wants me to work toward. This is the purpose of the process of sanctification. This is the purpose of being created in Christ Jesus to do good works prepared to advance for us to do. This is the purpose. It is to accomplish the privilege of accomplishing kingdom work by the hand of God to the glory of God. This is the ongoing sanctification of my own self as I'm conformed more and more into the likeness of Jesus. And this is God working everything for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. And that good purpose is to love us and then to love us sincerely and then to enable us to love and to love sincerely just as he's loved me. So then we ask. So let's ask a couple questions here. Ready? What is sincere love? Now we've talked about this a little bit in the past. Actually, we've talked about this quite a bit in the past, but it bears repeating, especially in our time right now. We talk about the circumstances in which our lives are intersecting. I want you to think about Facebook for a minute. In each individual, you see saying something on your Facebook newsfeed. Think about it. Just get, get. think about it. Think about what that does to you in the moment. Agree or disagree? Stop. That's a circumstance in which your lives intersect. Think about going to the store and walking the aisles and seeing what you see and seeing who you see and seeing the circumstance for what it is and how you feel, good or bad. God, I could go on. I don't need to. We all get the picture. The reason this verse is alive and active, God's word, right? And it cuts right through to the marrow. And, it's, and, and this is the Holy Spirit breathing this thing. And the scripture, the, the, the word of God is as deep as the person of God. And alive as the person of God. In fact, he says not a stroke is going to leave this thing ever. You know why? First of all, it's his word. The expression of his mind, his heart. His will. Second of all, it's alive and active. It, it, it is always moving, always growing, always, always applying to the moment. And each moment we have is unlike the moment we just came out of. Stop. Every moment we live, every breath we take is utterly different from the breath we just took. And each circumstance is its own. And the word has to be alive in it to enable us to see it through the lens of Jesus by his love, according to his purposes, that we would now bow to his will in this time. It changes. The word doesn't change in the sense that it is the truth, it is the truth of God, and it speaks the same thing. But it speaks in beautiful and new ways, just as his mercies are new every morning, even though his mercy is always and always will be, so is his word. And his word is an expression of his mercy, and we need to, we need to allow this to be new and fresh in us, because our circumstances are new and fresh. And our heart is in a different condition at every step of the way. And it meets us at points of our heart that, we, that no, other, no other thing hit our heart. And it, sometimes it hits areas of our heart that are mature and complete and strong. And sometimes it hits areas of our heart that are, that are weak and, and, and neglected and sinful. 
And our reaction is, is almost always an expression of where that thing hits my heart and the part of my heart that it hits and the condition my heart is in when it hits it and the circumstance I find myself in. That's why we need to love it just like that. So what is this sincere love? What is an unfeigned love? It's sincere. It's not phony. It's not put on. It describes sincere behavior, free from hidden agendas and selfish motives, literally without hypocrisy. Now, this is tough because it goes back to something I said before. I am called to love whether I f- what, no matter what I feel about you, I'm called to love you. Now, I want to go back a couple weeks because this is what's important. When we talk about this love, it is not the love we use all the time. It's not sentimentality. It's not storge in the sense of that connecting family love that a, a parent has for a child or a child or siblings for one another. No, it's, it's not brotherly love. It's not the, the, the warm feeling you get in that connection and the, the walking with that you have when you're with a good friend. All those can be woven in there, but that's not what this love is. This love is about their welfare, period. And it's a commitment to God's moral preference, which is what? That all men would be saved, no matter who they are, no matter where you find them, no matter what circumstance, what condition, how your lives intersect, that's what God wants. That's how he loved you. This love goes way beyond how we feel. And so don't think that just because you don't feel like loving somebody, but you're called to love them, that you don't have to love them because you feel insincere. No, no, no. What's insincere is when you say, when we say we're like Jesus and we refuse to love, that's insincere. That's hypocritical. I'm going to let that hang there. And be as convicted as I ever have been. So here we go. You ready? So one of the things I want to say about this word sincere, I think this is really, 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 really important. This word sincere in the Greek is distinctly Christian. In other words, the Holy Spirit worked with Paul to invent a Greek word that had never been used in any secular Greek literature. I'm getting this from a historian. In other words, he made this word up to describe the type of sincerity he's speaking of because it didn't exist anywhere else in literature. Why is that? Because this is a distinctly God thing. No human being can accomplish this. Nobody. The only people who can accomplish this kind of love is a spirit-filled, born-again, child of God through Jesus Christ. Period. Now, That can seem overwhelming, but this is what I want us to understand. God never commands us to do something he hasn't done. Neither does he ever command us to do something that he's, that that we cannot do. And and so when he commands it and he says, I've done this and you can do this, he does, what he says is I've empowered you to do it. It's important for us to recognize that truth. So what Paul has done here in essence is he made up a word that describes this genuine, authentic, spirit-prompted, empowered, Jesus enacted, thus imitated a divine love emitting from God, from God and his spirit that Jesus lived and commanded of his spirit-empowered siblings to be divinely expressed. Don't ask me to repeat that. This love centers on a moral preference. I prefer you and I prefer your well-being over my own rights, over my own liberties, over my own person, I prefer you. In this circumstance, in the condition I find you, what it is I see in you and who it is that I see that you are, I will dignify you as Christ dignified me and I will prefer your well-being just as God preferred mine. And he did it when I was his enemy and he made sure I remembered that because he wants us to know the degree of his mercy and his grace that is the expression of that love. It is so important that we come to realize this truth, that God would make up a word that did not exist in all of humanity before it to describe his love to mankind and in particular his children and then demand of his spirit-filled children as to how they love others. And this is distinctly what it means when it says in Ephesians, be an imitator of God, therefore as a dearly loved child. Mm. God has poured his, 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 his love into us by his Holy Spirit And he calls us to love this way. So next question. If that's sincere love, whose responsibility is it to love? Is it mine? Is it always mine? Yes. 
I can't, I have no control over how somebody receives my love or whether somebody loves me back. Jesus said, I came to my own and my own would not receive me. Boom. I loved the people of this earth and they have rejected me. Yet his love stands. This love is not a reciprocal love. It's not a love that I wait for to be loved by to express. Eros is. If I'm passionate about you, it's, I want you to be able to reciprocate it. If I find you don't reciprocate it, then my passion needs to be allowed to wane and I'm no longer passionate or vice versa. It's reciprocal. A storge love is reciprocal. A, ch- a parent loves his child and it's such a natural expression that they can't help but love their child and the child re- is, returns that love. Brotherhood, this, bro, this, uh, this idea of phileo, yes, it's reciprocal. I, can't call, I can call somebody a brother, but if they don't reciprocate, we don't walk in fellowship with one another necessarily. Now, the initial expression of this love is reciprocal in this sense, of this agape love, this sincere love. See, God expresses it regardless of whether you're reciprocated or not. A child of God reciprocates it when they recognize it for what it is. They receive that mercy and grace, the forgiveness of their sins, the adoption as a child, and they turn and love the father in turn. But the love, my returning that love did not, was not the condition under which God would love me. He loved me before I became his child. He loved me to make me his child. He loved me as he adopted me as his child. And he loves me as his child. As I've been loved now, I can reciprocate. But I don't always reciprocate, right, in a, in a practical sense. What did Jesus say? The one who loves me is the one who has my commands and does them. Do I always obey his commands? No, I don't. I don't always then reciprocate. But because now I've been adopted into his family, that love for me is maintained and sustained by him. And so when I fail to reciprocate, he disciplines me as a child and calls me back to his side that I would remember his mercy and grace and I would come back with love. But his love never stopped for me. Now he's saying, I want you to demonstrate this love to others. I want, to be, I want you to be the vessel through whom I love. I want you then to be the extension of my hands, the extension of my feet, the extension of the resources I have placed in your hands, the extension of the blessings that I have given you, the extension of the kingdom of heaven. I want that, I, that's your privilege. Walk with me. So who am I responsible to love? Well, this is interesting. Jesus got asked this question when he said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And one of the Pharisees who had just gotten accolades, he said, he, 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 he said to Jesus, here's the greatest commandment. And, and Jesus said, that's awesome. You got it. Then he, but then he had, to, he had to mess it up. What did he say? Then wanting to justify himself, he turns to Jesus, but who is my neighbor? Who am I, who am I supposed to love? What did Jesus do then? He told a parable. We call it the Good Samaritan. The Jews would have called it, are you kidding me? No, let me say that again. We call it the Good Samaritan. The Jews would have said, what? No, no. I have to love like a Samaritan? What? Why? Because they hated the Samaritans. They were were enemies of the Samaritans. So Jesus purposely chose a Samaritan to demonstrate God's love to them and who it is they were to love and who it is they had the choice to love, which is everybody. Anybody, so what happened to the Good Samaritan? If we were to go there, we're not gonna, but if we were in Luke chapter 10, you can look at it later. What's he, what happens? There was a circumstance in which two lives intersected. It was not a great circumstance. In fact, the Jews would have said the guy deserved what he got because he, he was going alone on a place he shouldn't have been. He deserved it. Number one. Number two, that circumstance where those two lives intersected, the man saw the condition of the man. Both the stupidity with which he traveled and then the place he found him in the circumstance. Then what happened? Well, then he reflected on what the man's needs were and then discovered who the man was. And what did he do? He loved his neighbor. How did he love him? The same way Jesus loves us. He gave of himself. Why would we ask this question? Why? Why do we want to know who our neighbor is? Because we want to choose who we love. 
Our flesh wants to love who we love, who we feel like loving, because that seems sincere. No, not so, not so. See, I have to understand something. I'm held accountable for one thing by God. Not who, uh, who, not who loves me, or not who I love who reciprocates that love, but just who I love. I am called to love. And I'm responsible for the loving. And I don't have a lot of choice as to who that is. Because it is God who orchestrates my steps. Right? I can make all kinds of plans, but he directs my steps. And he orchestrates me on a, on a road of righteousness for his name's sake. And that road of righteousness intersects people who, in, in the circumstance, might not be the righteousness I anticipated. And as he's leading me on this road of righteousness, what he means is, I need you to act righteously, regardless of the circumstance, the person with whom you, your life is intersected, the condition you find them in, what they are, and who they are. Mm. And so what if they don't return my love? What is that to you? The command doesn't say love because they'll love you back. In fact, if we were to actually go through Matthew 5 and Luke 6, Jesus says plainly we are to love those who will not love us back, give to those who will not give back, not demand back what somebody steals from us. That when somebody slaps us on the right cheek, they, we give them the left also. Let's look at Luke chapter 6 real quick. These principles lie right here. The one we just read in Romans 12, 18, or 19, which says, as long as it's up to you, live at peace. And then this one, Luke 6. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. Even those who are separate from God. Even those who have evil intent. Evil, even those who have, who have not been redeemed and, and set free by Christ and whose heart is being formed into the shape of Jesus. Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you, and if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. Verse 35. But I say, he says, love sincerely. Look what it says. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your love will be great. And you will be children of the Most High God because he himself is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked, and we might as well do this. So therefore, be merciful toward others as your heavenly Father is merciful and has been toward you. That's love. Sincere love. So maybe we need to ask ourselves this question. Can love be sincere? as the scriptures talk about and define sincere love, if once that love is tested or even opposed, that that love ceases. Now, I'm going to mention something here. In fact, I had a conversation with a good friend of mine this last week regarding this issue. There are extreme ends of the spectrum of the people we meet and the circumstances we find themselves in, the condition of who they are, and what that relationship has been. For me to love somebody sincerely doesn't mean I have to befriend them doesn't mean that I'm to be close to them. If somebody has systematically or systemically or in, in some way hurt me or caused significant harm or abuse, I'm, Jesus is not saying, I want you to be their friend. You need to be with them. That's not what he's saying here. But it is a challenge to do as Jesus both did and instructed. We are challenged in this sense to love them anyway. But that, listen to me, from a distance. So I wrote this to my friend in response to their question. When we cannot nor should not be near someone, we need to remember that this does not mean we cannot nor should not agape them or love them sincerely. This is when Jesus' command to pray for those who mistreat you becomes very real. And we come to understand this truth. Listen. Listen. Prayer is closer than and as loving as physical proximity. 
Pr- prayer is closer than and as loving as physical pro- proximity. We have to trust the Holy Spirit to get inside a person when we cannot or should not be beside a person. Remembering that our Father loves them more than we do, He loves them more than we can, and does so with no risk to Himself. So let Him trust Him and join him in loving them in and with prayer. As this is what he commands, and this is the privilege to love with him, like him. We are not called to befriend these people, to walk in close proximity to them, but that doesn't give us permission to not want their welfare, their blessing. As difficult as that is for our flesh to even comprehend We need to take that and place it in our God's hands and remember we are to pray for those who mistreat us and bless those who curse us and present them to our Father only by the power of the Holy Spirit, resting in him, knowing that he will do this work and he he gives us the privilege of joining in his work in essence vicariously. And this is a blessing and this is a form of healing. So, is this hard Of course it's hard. There's no doubt in my mind that it's hard. For me, it's hard. And so now I have to ask for wisdom. If I'm saying, God, I don't know how to love that way, I can't imagine you'd ask me to love that way, this is what I need to do. Father, give me wisdom. James says this, if anyone lacks wisdom in a difficult circumstance, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and and he will give it to you. He will give it to you. Okay, I'm running out of time. There are a couple specific things I want to get to, though, before I close up. So bear with me, if you would. I thank you so much for just giving me a moment. What are the specifics? Is there a limit to what God is asking me to do? Well, this is another question as old as humanity's existence. What Peter, this is, we have to ask ourselves, what did Jesus tell Peter when Peter tried to impress Jesus with his magnanimity, with his bountiful display of forgiveness? When he said, well, how often do I have to forgive? Is it seven times? And Peter is patting himself on the back and saying, listen to me. And Jesus turns to him and says, oh, no, 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 no. 70 times, seven times. What do, you, what do we think he meant by that? He's talking about how we've been forgiven. He's talking about how many times we have to be forgiven. He's talking about having been forgiven that way that we would recognize and be grateful for it and then grant that mercy to someone else. Take a look at the parable of the wicked servant when you have a moment and how Jesus holds accountable the one who has been forgiven much yet will forgive little. So what is this love? What is it? If it is patient, kind, not rude, persevering, wouldn't it be true that there is not a single one of its virtues that cannot prove themselves unless they are tested? In other words, every attribute of God, or attribute of love as God, as God defines it, as God accomplished it, as God has enabled it, every one of them only exists when it's tested. I don't need to be patient unless somebody tests my patience. I don't need to be faithful if somebody doesn't test my faithfulness. (laughs) My love isn't love until it's been tested, proven. Anybody can love anybody when everything goes well. This is so important. Jesus said in John 13, he said this, and then I'm going to close. He said, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. As I have loved you, love one another, and you show myself as my, you show yourself as my disciple. Ben, go ahead and get in place, if you would, please. This is what I want us to understand about the New Testament. 
The gospels are the expression of God's love in Christ Jesus. He is the very word of God. He's the wisdom of God. He's the love of God. He is the expression of God's fullness. The rest of the New Testament is an entire educational and vocational training on the loving of one another, period. And having that loving be a sincere act that demonstrates our being transformed and are miraculously empowered to, to transcend our own flesh, to rise above it, and its desires to love to be able to love one another as Jesus loved us. When and how Jesus loved us, to make a body, a fellowship that declares to the world that there is a God among us, that Jesus' death and his life and his resurrection is real and the power of the Holy Spirit does exist in us. All of this has to be understood. And I want us to hear it in in these words. The power of the Holy Spirit in us is best displayed is not best displayed by random demonstrations of charisma but by consistent overcoming of the flesh and its selfish desires the miraculous power to enable disparate people different people to be one in spirit one in mind and one in mission this miraculous power of the Holy Spirit and his ability to transform lives is, the ability, is his ability to produce love in the hearts and the lives of human beings, period. That is what will attract the lost to Jesus. It is this sincere love that testifies to Jesus' reality, his ability, nay, his desire to save, to redeem, and to transform. We'll finish this up next week. May we this week walk in the sincerity of love that Christ has loved us. The circumstance he finds me in, where our lives have intersected, the condition that he finds me in, what I am, and then dignifying who I am. May we return that in every moment of every day.
Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your incredible mercies and your grace. We thank you for the love you have loved us with. We thank you that in your faithfulness, Lord God, you have empowered us. You have not commanded us to do anything that you haven't equipped us and empowered us to do. And then you guide us on a path of righteousness for your name's sake. And that path of righteousness is each one of our lives as you orchestrate it. As we have made our plans and you determine our steps. Every circumstance we find ourselves in, we have an opportunity and the privilege to walk and to act righteously. To bring your truth to bear. To bring your love to bear. And this brings you glory and allows the world around us to see the reality of who you are. As we love one another and that love spills out into a lost world. May we walk that way this week. May rejoice deeply in what it is we have. May we be grateful. May we look forward through this season to the celebration of your coming and the remembrance of all that you are and do. May we walk with you through this Advent in a way that it makes your life that much more real and deep and refreshing. Not only in our lives, but in the lives of all we touch. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.